afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Project Data Analytics community session on uh, visions. So the visions for 2025. We'll just wait a few minutes and then uh, we'll get going. So welcome to James as well. So James is on the panel today. Um, so we'll just give it two or three minutes while people start to stream in and then we'll launch in. So while we're waiting, is it worth a quick introduction from the panel? Uh, so if I'm going with Andy first, Andy, welcome. Yeah, welcome everyone. Andy Murray, the Executive Director of the Major Projects Association. I'm also the Chair of the APM's Governance uh, Special Interest Group uh, Committee, and I'm a member of the Project Data Analytics Task Force. Okay, cool. Thank you, Andy, and welcome. And James? Thanks. You're mute. First, I've got that out of the way, so no one else can embarrass themselves. <laughs> <laughs> I'm James Garner. I'm a, I'm a senior director at Glee, so a construction consultancy specialising in project management, quantity surveying, and uh, other kind of advisory topics. But I'm also uh, recently uh, taken on the chairmanship of the Project Data Analytics Task Force. So watch this space. We'll talk about that a yeah. bit more <laughs> shortly. Um, and then uh, I've also uh, you know, working very closely with Martin and the, the Project Data Analytics community in kind of pushing this vision forward for uh, changing the way that we deliver projects. Okay, thank you, James. Welcome. And Donny. Oh, hi. I um, My day job is consultancy and advisory work for government and private sector organizations so developing digital strategies delivery approaches um and competence frameworks and so on so a lot of the stuff we've done has been very human centric and now we've wrapped in this digital and data thing into it and the exciting bit is how the human element can get adapted and brought into this world of data and ai and we've got some pilots and some work on exactly that running and maybe get an opportunity to share a little bit later on that. OK, cool. Thank you. And Jake, go for Jake. Thanks, Martin. So Jake Williams, I'm a product manager at Projecting Success um, and alongside Martin, I've been responsible for leading the development of these visions for 2025 for how um, projects can be reimagined and transformed using project data analytics and artificial intelligence. OK, cool. Thank you. And I've just seen that Joe Jolly's rocked up. So, Joe, are you there? Would you like to join us on the panel or are you having your pot noodle and you'd rather be left in peace? <laughs> Is there a third option? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Martin, we were meant to be having our team day say, and it's tomorrow. So um, I was able to join after all. I, I have joined at short notice, though, so I'm more than happy uh, just to be part of the crowd and, and join in the general discussion. Okay, no, thank you, works Joe. For you, Martin, it's just fab to be here. Thank you. Yeah, cool. Thank you. So last but not least, I'm Martin Paber. So I'm the chief exec of uh, Projector Success, um, the founder of the Project Day 26 community. And I love this stuff. All right, we can really change society with it. So if I can open up with Andy. So what's the problem that we're trying to solve here, Andy? So just yes, give a bit so, of a backdrop to it. Yes, yeah, so thanks, thanks, Martin. So um, I've worked for now for 30 years in project program management, spent a fair amount of my time in what I would call sort of the methods and frameworks aspects of projects. So how do we codify what good looks like? And I, I have this you know, career of shame uh, that, um, that we've been doing it uh, in what I've recently been called um, from a position of winging it in, in that if we set up how we go about delivering projects and we're doing it not in a data driven approach, so we're not using data to make decisions about our uh, the, the the way in which we set up and deliver our projects. Then we are just making it up as we go along or winging it. So we need to move from winging it to having a data driven approach, which is why you know I supported and uh, you know colleagues on the call here um, uh, and contributed to uh, the manifesto for a, a data driven approach to to, to projects. And if I think back to some of the work that I've done 
in developing you know uh, methods and frameworks um and look at where we may have put something into how we deliver projects that was at the time regarded as um de facto you know good practice best practice and i would just pick on the iron triangle of time cost quality we've been using that for years and in fact if any of you went on to project management training today project management school you'll be taught about the, the iron triangle which is great from a project scoping perspective and helping us make choices and priorities with our projects but Professor Rodney Turner proved some time ago through studying lots and lots of projects and doing some analytics around it that if you use it as a base of control your projects will run out of control yet we're still taught the iron triangle as a basis of control so you know, that's an example of where we have a bit of a myth that's built up over time and with some data analytics we can dispel that myth and we can take a different approach so one of the things that we've got if we look at how data analytics and the power of technology that supports it is being used in other domains like marketing or customer services even transport the way we use technology in our cars and our sat navs and our choices about how we go about moving around the country how we use you know the train line and, and other apps to to make choices as to the optimum route and whether we're going to do journey time or whether we're going to do you know ease of journey or whether we're just going to worry about when we get somewhere rather than the actual time taken for journey these are things we're doing now in every aspect of our life and indeed it's even you being used in things as, as sort of thuggish as as, as football or, or soccer depending upon which side of the atlantic you're, you're from so we know it can make an impact we know it can make things different so the challenge we've got is that we don't just want to automate automate the things we're currently doing we want to reimagine how we do some of these things we want to have that same shift of thinking with the iron triangle from using it yes great for scoping but not so much for control we need to do it in in those ways so um, in order to do that we need to think about well what are those big buckets uh, of, of project management practice like risk and stakeholders and governance and assurance and can we set out what the current setup looks like and can we start to unpick where perhaps uh, it's not just about automating those it's about thinking of them differently and uh, that's the work that uh, Martin and co and Jake has been uh, uh, working on uh, through sort of soliciting input and I think we're ready to hear about some of those today so uh, that's all I'll do I hope that frames it well enough Martin and uh, perhaps I'll hand over to, to Jake next okay superb it's a great introduction it's a great context set as well <clears throat> in terms of your experience Andy you understand this more than a lot of people in terms of the methods, you know, the bodies of knowledge you've been involved in shaping those. And it's really refreshing. You know, we're accepting is that weaknesses in terms of where we are now. Let's not throw it all away, but let's just start to reimagine those fundamentals. So if I could just pass over to Jake. Can Jake's going to walk us through a bit of the visions about. So what is all this about and what does it mean? So, Jake, the floor is yours, sir. Great stuff. Thank you, Andy. Thanks for the intro and thank you, Martin. So I guess the the big question is why do we need the visions? So the challenge we face and I can um, certainly speak from experience um, in this regard is that project delivery professionals are head down delivering projects and we don't have the well, I didn't previously and, and many project professionals don't now often don't have the headspace or understanding of advanced analytics to imagine what what the future might look like um, when when you know, some of this technology becomes more advanced. So if we ask people a question about what um, what they want uh, project delivery to look like, um, as Andy alluded to, they would typically like us to improve on the, the current methods of project delivery um, of project controls rather than stepping back and thinking about, OK, what, what are we trying to do here? What are we trying to deliver? How do we make these projects better? How do we improve that statistic around 0.5% projects being delivered on time, on budget um, and, and to, to, to deliver benefits? Um, so how do we expand people's horizons um, and shape that level of ambition? So when asked about um, development for the uh, or customer input to the development of the Ford Model T, um, back in the day, Henry Ford famously said, if I'd asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. And that's the that's the predicament we're in in, uh, in project delivery. 
um, and that is why we've created this series of visions for 2025. So working in collaboration with the project data analytics community, we want to reimagine how we deliver projects uh, and reimagine how we work. So rather than creating risk management dashboards, can we pivot from sort of process heavy risk management to looking at um, how we can predict where we're predisposed to variance in projects? Um, in the domain of stakeholder management, how do we move from um, capturing stakeholders on a whiteboard, storing that information on a PowerPoint deck um, for it never to be seen again? Uh, how do we go from that to then dynamically capturing key stakeholder groups and graph networks, which will update as the project progresses um, as we go along that project timeline? Um, so that's why we that's why we need the visions and we also need a framework within which to deliver those visions and to take them from what we currently have on a, a PowerPoint deck uh, to making them happen in real life on real projects. Um, and that's what we have in front of us. So um, the framework goes as follows. So we work together as a community to understand the problems we are facing in each discipline. We pull on the experts in each field to break down the problems in their current roles. We then store this in a graph database so we can visualize all of the problem statements um, as well as potential solutions. Um, and then we create the visions, which is which is what we've done, which is what we've made way through um, before breaking down those visions into manageable mini projects, which can be delivered via hackathons, uh, via apprentice projects, and through pilot projects with our project delivery partners um, on real life projects, we actually test the theory. So where are we with those visions? So this is a, uh, a quick status report on where we've got to. Um, so we've got three uh, visions which have been released so far. So those are the uh, vision for reimagining benefits management, for reimagining lessons which are not currently being learned, um, and also for reimagining uh, project assurance. So I think it's worth saying that these have been developed with um, contributions from a number of different organisations, including some really big players within the, the project delivery industry. Um, and we've received some really expert insights to the, to the challenges which projects and project delivery is currently facing, as well as some great ideas around some potential solutions. Um, and that's what we try to outline in these documents. Um, so with the three visions that have been released on LinkedIn so far, they will also be going out onto our website soon. Um, so keep an eye on our website in the next couple of weeks because because they will be going up there. Um, and then we have a further five visions which are currently in various stages of development uh, and some of which will be released shortly. So um, it's a bit of a call to action for those who are for those who are interested. Um, we're still welcoming contributions to the contents of those visions. Um, and so if that is something which uh, interests you, oh, I've just seen the question in the chat and this is uh, perfectly timed. So yeah, if that's something which which interests you, uh, reach out to me on LinkedIn after this webinar and I can step you through the process by which we um, uh, can allow people to contribute to these if they so wish. So the next thing is to give you a peek through a couple of the slides from one of the visions. Um, so if you've been following Martin's LinkedIn post closely, you will have seen three of these complete visions released on LinkedIn by now. Um, but for those who haven't, this is a, a sneak peek at the, the title and one of the slides towards the back of the pack. Um, and I'll just outline um, what goes into into these slide packs in the middle. So generally we start out with a, a few definitions to get everyone thinking on the same lines. Um, and then we proceed to make the case for the need for change in that particular function or area of project delivery by outlining some of the issues with the current approach to the discipline, whilst also hinting at, um, at potential solutions. Then we start to reimagine how the project delivery discipline might function when all the barriers have been removed um, and data is being shared freely. 
And this section is deliberately aspirational to try and uh, get people behind the vision. Um, so I've selected in this case the vision for reimagining assurance, which we'll be going through in more detail more detail um, in our second webinar in this series, which is taking place on the 6th of June. So between 6 and 7, uh, 6 and 7 p.m. on the 6th of June. The current so, um, so make make sure you tune into that um, on on the 6th of June. Um, and then the final part. So sorry, just getting back to that. So on the on this uh, next generation assurance um, event, we'll be doing a deeper dive into that that particular vision. So um, we'll have uh, another panel of experts who you know have vast experience in uh, the arena of project assurance and uh, you know, assuring major projects across a number of different disciplines. So um, yeah, get that date in your diary. OK, so moving on to the second slide I will be sharing. So this is about how we work towards the visions. So this part is all about the um, how do we translate the vision into the products and solutions um, that we will need to deliver in, in real life to really change these projects. Um, and it also shows that the sequence which we are likely to deliver deliver them in based on the um, the challenge and the uh, the difficulty of each uh, sort of product or solution. Um, so each of the bubbles on the chart is a uh, module of capability or a hack challenge or a pilot project which will push us closer to our end goal or North Star for each functional area. So you can see for um, for assurance, the, the North Star vision is the, the eye of Sauron, so you'll have to tune in in a couple of weeks time to, to understand the, the sort of the idea behind that. But um, yeah, that's that's what we're aiming for. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that's 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 the end goal. And we've mapped out our shared ambition across three time horizons. So you'll be able to see on the, the chart there, we've got horizon one, horizon two, and horizon three. So horizon one is a iteration of the here and now. So generally adding polish to what already exists. This is where most organizations currently are and what they tend to be asking for from, um, from consultants. That's what they're, that's what they're looking for. Um, Horizon 2 begins to look at new methods and ways of working, generally building on the, uh, the products and solutions from Horizon 1. Um, and then Horizon 3 is where the greatest value resides. That's where we begin to really reimagine how we work, change our approach and leverage you know, large volumes of shared data, um, which allows us to work towards our, our North Star. Um, and uh, yeah, so that that image summarizes our vision for uh, project assurance. The challenge with that is that it's quite difficult to deliver Horizon 3 in, in one jump. So that's why we need to um, experiment and run pilot projects so that we don't deliver Horizon 1, Horizon 2 and Horizon 3 se sequentially. We, act, we can actually um, take off a piece of the Horizon 3 um, the more difficult projects um, and experiment with them and see how far we can get. Um, and that, that will lead us to um, increase our learning and uh, yeah, find out further problems which we're not currently aware of. So um, that's how we're, we're looking to approach these visions. Um, and just one final slide on this from me for now. Is this is an example of how um, that bubble chart can then be transformed into a, a mini project. So this is one of the Horizon 1 modules from our lessons learned vision. Um, and this is an example of how it can be converted from the bubble page um, into a hack challenge or apprenticeship project or a potential mini pilot project. Um, and this is what we envision taking place all across the different visions and across project delivery. So we envision sort of you know, 50 to 100 projects um, taking place concurrently, which will allow us to um, really drive this industry forward. Um, right, that's it from me for now. So I'm going to 
pass it back to is it back to you martin or back to james fantastic thank you jay i really appreciate it. <clears throat> so that's a great introduction to you know the visions for 2025 so could somebody just explain why 2025 so what's the reason for choosing that anybody james so why 2025 why did we choose the 2025 We've got to move fast on this. I think, you know, it's it sounds ambitious, but the reality is if we don't do this, then we're, you know, other big tech will will come and take our place. So it's incumbent on us to to get this moving fast. Sandy, what's your view on it as well? So if you can link back to the report we did back in 2020. Yeah, we would um about half a percent that Jake mentioned earlier. Um you know, there's some low hanging fruit there, isn't there, in terms of uh, the potential to improve and the, you know, the task force, the project data analytics task force when it was first formed, looked at, could we do something like a tenfold improvement um, on, on project performance? Now, that's only moving from half a percent to five percent, but actually we would all take that, wouldn't we, you know, in terms of uh, that, that that big improvement. Um, and, and given it was a whole bunch of fives, you know, um, 2025 was uh, with that sort of five year horizon which actually is very close now. It doesn't feel they're very far away, does it? It will be upon 2025 pretty quickly. So, but as James saying, the, the pace of change that we've seen when we set out back in 2020, we didn't imagine these large language models landing and being publicly available. Uh, and then new ones popping up every week. I think since chat, uh, you know, the, the chat GPT was made available by OpenAI, I saw something that some about 25 different large language models have been uh, made available. I mean, it's just incredible at the pace that we're seeing. Yeah. So why don't we just leave this to the market then? So who wants to come in on that? So there's lots of vendors out there who's going to be selling this. There's OpenAI, you know, you've got the smaller vendors. Why don't we just leave this to the market? Because then what's your view on that? My view is, you know, you see other industries where that has happened and what you do is you give up control you know we're we're giving do we trust the big tech companies and the market to look after our industry with the best interests that we have as project professionals you know they've got very clear objectives so and my issue is that what once you've done that once you've given up control you can't get it back it's too late it's not one of those things where you can say oh we'll deal with it later we've got a window of opportunity between probably now and 2025 probably sooner in reality to to deal with this as an industry together uh, otherwise you know we do basically trust our entire industry to people who let's face it haven't always necessarily got the best record when it comes to dealing with interests of the public yeah so what does that oh, mean then well, so I was just going to, I was going to add to that. I mean, I, I not want to bring in new topics, but your the 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 work in the data trust, which no doubt you mentioned, the work in the actual community itself. If we just took the built environment world, it's and sorry for anybody in the call who isn't in it, but it's already a massively fragmented, complex world. If you then lay on top a vast number of different suppliers, models, structures, on top of already messy situation you're going to get an awful lot of winners and losers within that if you did have a democratised collaborative solution. It's not going to be everyone that everyone would buy into it. You've got a chance of raising the whole industry up and having some level, get, removing a little bit of the complexity already within the supply chain and the way it's all fragmented. So it's a kind of, the, the, there's, there's a lot of big wins, but there are other things, as you know better than me, Martin, about data trust, et cetera, that all would play a part in that. It's a great point as well, Donny. And I think the sort of point for me is, if we work together on this, what does it mean for the future role of a project professional, right? So you can either become a tool jockey where you buy 600 of these different tools, a chat GBT model over here, a machine learning model there, a bit of Power BI, a bit of Power Apps, whatever. So you've got loads and loads of capabilities. So you just become a tool jockey or we can start to shape this. So does somebody fancy having a go at, you know, what that difference in potential future for project delivery professionals looks like? So, James, I think you're probably closest to that. Do you want to go at that one? Yeah, that's a, it, it's a tough question. But if you go down to scenarios, 
one scenario is we we give control and we basically become tool jockeys as you as you call it the the, the natural consequence of that is um ob, ob, you know a lot of roles become obsolete because clients will say well i don't need a tool jockey i'll do it myself um as these tools become better and better and they in the short term that'd be very attractive because they'd probably think oh i'll save money i won't have to pay fees for this project professional but it's a it's a trap because as we know what these companies do they get you to the point that they've sucked you in and then they start charging it back to you so the other side what we can do is work with you know, as Donnie said, you know, kind of work with people, put some rules of engagement around it, take back control in terms of making sure that we're we're putting the rules of engagement to these tech companies, try and democratize things, try and make it open source so that we can evolve our professions. Like, I think it's without without doubt professions are going to change. There's no point in saying we're still going to be doing things the same way in five or ten years time they are going to change but the difference for me is we can like you say martin we can shape it to what we know will be best and it always comes down to this what's best for our clients what's best for project delivery i have much more trust the people uh who are in this space like the guys on this panel than i would you know a big autodesk or microsoft taking control of it so yeah i think it's all to play for so in terms of the open source model, you talked about democratizing this. Is that a bit naive? You know, because there's all these vendors out there, you're going to be working against their interests. Is there space for both? If we open source everything, is that a realistic future? Yeah, I think there is space for both because you, you still want to work with these people who are developing the really high end solutions. Um, but we don't need them, you know, doing you know kind of the more middle solution that that's the kind of stuff that we can get involved with but i think what's important is there is no framework at the moment about how we deal with these third parties and um you know martin you and i and, and joe are talking at the rcs conference tomorrow for instance about trying to get these big institutions and it's great you know andy so from the mpa is so uh ahead on this i, I feel in in terms of let, let's let's say you know we can work with some of these vendors, but with this, it seems to be very one-sided at the moment. So you sign up to use an Autodesk product. Does anyone actually know what you're signing away? Uh, if one company tries to push against it, it's going to be very hard. But as an institution, as a together, we can work together to actually say, well, yeah, you can use our data, but there's certain caveats. There's certain things you can and can't do. And actually, we don't want to just give all, all control. So I think there is place, you know, that the, these these software vendors have huge resources available to them. And if they can start working on some of the high end solutions, that can free us up to deliver the stuff that we're best at. So what does that mean for roles as well? So in terms of your role, for instance, it's changed quite a lot and Jake's as well. Yeah. So can you give some examples where your roles are starting to evolve. So a lot of people ask about this and I think it's. Um, the first thing I say is this is nothing new. Roles have always evolved, right? So if you took um, if you look back at my, my my background is quantity surveying, you know, that has changed. If you went back to the to the 70s, it, it has evolved. It's, it's similar, but it's evolved. Um, I think the difference is it's the pace of change. So, but previously it might take 20 years to make a step change in how you do things. Now, it, now, as as Andy said, you know, you, things are exponential and they're changing extremely, extremely fast. So it feels like it's um, a massive monumental shift. But all that's happened, it's it's a it's just happening in a shorter time scale. So, um, and that, that can be scary for people, but. You put, what I think you should do, is we should embrace it because actually the, the mixture of the domain skills, all of us as project professionals, mixing that with with data or digital kind of expertise is really, really rare. And I found that out, you know, dealing with the data and digital people who don't have the domain expertise, they don't get our industry, they don't understand it. We don't do ourselves enough justice about how incredible that what we, we do is it's really complex you know when we put together a building or a highway or whatever it may be it's incredibly complex the amount of people that come together so donnie alluded to it the the, the the amount of suppliers that is and and that actually um 
and a lot of people in the data space they haven't come across anything like that before so they're not necessarily the best people to to deal with it we're still the best people to deal with it all we've got to do is we've got to actually marry the two together marry the data-driven approach with the domain expertise and there's no one better to do it than than people like us yeah cool so jake in terms of your role right so you were on hs2 before doing risk manager you've now got a very different role how are these visions going to assist your previous life right so all those risk managers out there all those project professionals out there what's it actually going to mean for you so i think reflecting on my 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 sort of most recent experience prior to to joining projecting success in this product management role so i was working on a um fairly large high speed rail project which i won't won't name and um we were we had all these great ideas around what we could do for um in terms of developing uh, additional projects for risk management, which would help us to you know, manage manage the risk on the projects. Um, but because of the the way the organisation was set up, there's a the sort of um, the technical IT development team was fairly underpowered um, relative to the the project delivery uh, the, or the the size of the the project delivery sort of cohort, um, and it meant that any sort of innovation or ideas around innovation that we did have um, weren't able to be realized because we weren't able to develop them ourselves. Um, we probably didn't have the, the skill set to develop them, um, but we also didn't have the sort of the tools and the framework to develop them. So the way I see these visions um, sort of rolling out, I, I see an opportunity for benefits managers, risk managers, you know, um, professionals from all across the disciplines I see an opportunity for them to be able to uh, innovate effectively if they have the skills to that uh, to be able to do that um, if they uh, are um, pushed to do that if, if they have the framework to do that then I see that um, you know risk managers can can innovate can um, incorporate machine learning into um, what they're doing um, so I I definitely see um, more scope for innovation um, based on uh, the, based on the, a new skill set. So they can start to pick these packages, those bubbles you showed us on the assurance sort of vision. If they can pick up those packages of work, they can integrate them themselves, I presume, and then work out what's missing and then come back and put another bubble on there and we'll co-create it. So instead of each company working up all those solutions individually so you have a hundred companies working on the same solution we can have a hundred companies working on different solutions so we go a hundred times quicker that's it yeah. and i think that that's what james was alluding to with the sort of the lower to mid uh level um you know in terms of difficulty projects um those are things that project professionals are probably best placed to deliver because they understand the domain um and that was a frustration of mine on on the previous project was that we knew what we wanted to uh, produce we knew the types of products that we needed but the lag between um sort of our input and then the uh, availability of the developers time meant that that loop took too long to sort of uh to come around and it you know it took took years to to get anything done so um if project professionals are just delivery professionals are able to do that development themselves or you know within small teams then yeah then the, the scope for innovation improves massively they yeah, cool so vested interest then so a question for andy and donny right there's a lot of vested interest in these solutions so if i was a, a big consultancy with a multinational reach i'd think oh look at all these solutions i can go and sell to people around the world i can make loads of money just by sat on the beach and been asleep all right so what does that mean what does that mean for the big consultancies are they going to work against this are they going to work with it is there space for both what does it mean yes yeah, so martin if i can come in here if, if anyone watched the launch video you can see it on youtube of gpt4 um they gave an example of where they put you know um, fifteen thousand pages of uh, us uh, tax law uh, into the large language model uh, and then they go with a fictitious scenario of alice and john who gave their earnings and they just sold a house and can you prepare their tax return and it did it um and, and it did it 
um, correctly. Um, now that's something we would otherwise have paid, you know, a service um, to an accountancy firm or tax advisor to, uh, to 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 do that calculation for us. So that's an example for me where the the value add is not in the in the data itself. Uh, or even in the sort of the computation that's taken place. Um, and there'll be project equivalent where the, the the thing we're trying to do has got rules based. So you can codify up in the same way that they gave the 15,000 pages of, of tax guidance. But I would say to, as with those tax advisors, if I was working in a tax and accountancy firm now, I'd have uh, been thinking immediately after that video, we need to rethink our business model. And, and, and I think the, you know, the tool vendors and the consultancy firms need to do the same. And, and I think the, the value add won't be in the data that they, they sit on because that will either be out of date because the way we did projects previously is no longer how we're doing projects today. But if you've got some data trust where we're pooling our data, the you know, there, there's more value in that. But actually, it's about the insights and the and what you do with it. So it's the ability to use data and apply it is where the you know the competitive advantage will come from, not not in the not in routine calculations or or indeed sat on data. Um, so that that would be my you know my thinking about where the, where the market could be going. Um, and the other aspect is that you know we talked about the impact on roles. Um, you know, an analogy I've used a few times is is around you know the impact of data analytics on on the world of football. Um, and uh, there's a book called uh, Expected Goals, uh, and data analytics is not new in, in the world of football or sport. So it took many decades to persuade uh, you know sports professionals that it could act as a competitive uh, differentiator. Uh, and then there's there's now several organisations that collect uh, data uh, you know across all the the sport that's played. Uh, and then there are different models. But it was when they were able to describe it. In the way that the sort of the, the pundit on the sort of the Monday night in you know, a football show could, could describe it, that's when they got their breakthrough, and that's what we need to do too. But the impact of that um, being able to describe it in a way that you know that the players and the coaching staff and so on would could apply it is that football has changed. So the role of a winger of a forward is different to, than it was just three years ago, and that's because the analytics has now shown where you're most likely to score a goal and the patterns of play that will most likely result in a in an opportunity or a chance. So the, the, the game of football has changed. The roles of the players has changed. There's still 11 players on a pitch um, and, and the, the laws of soccer haven't changed, but the roles that the players are performing uh, is different. And, and we will have the same in projects. You know, the role of a planner will be very different in, in quite a short period of time to the role of a planner today. And maybe just keep keeping the theme going about elite athletes, you know, like myself. Now, there's my <laughs> whoop, whoop data that's telling me stress levels, my strain recovery, and finally I'm making use of it. So in an unbelievably small, crude way, Andy, you've talked about it. If I could maybe just take it a slightly different tack, um, Martin, which is you could say all of the, the, the visions and the adoption the, the biggest breakthrough would be the capabilities and aspirations of the cl major client bodies. And Andy, you know this better than than I do, you know, and, I, you know, you do it in one way, James. Andy, you've got a very unique, slightly different role. Joe and the calls get a slight, a different role again. Just kind of is if they don't have, first of all, likely the capabilities to even understand what they what could be achieved. And then the aspiration to do something about it. And thank goodness there are people at Joe around who have said we are going to do something about this. Then you look at the adoption, the visions, and you don't give the big consultancies the choice. Because at the moment it's, and I'm, by the way, nothing, I'm not talking against big consultancy. You used the example, Martin. Um, it's it's very hard for them to change or any other consultancy can try to change what they do if it serves them well. And it needs the client to go, you know, we want to rethink this dramatically, how we go about this. We do want our data pulled to this. We do want commonality across all our projects. We don't want to want it in this project and this part of our portfolio. We want to take up section or et cetera, et cetera. But I think that's ever been the same, Andy. I think of 20 years ago in the APM, what do we need to do to make change of an X? Yeah. We need to get to the client bodies, the regulators, 
and get them to go, yeah. this is what it is we want. Yeah, you're right, Donnie. I mean, uh, we can compare projects, uh, you know, the practice of projects to medical practice in that project management is one massive experiment. Because if it wasn't, we would know exactly how to do it and we would have a 100% success rate every time. Because we don't, we know that we're experimenting. Now, when we experiment, we'll be doing some because we've done all of the analysis and actually it's a really predictive approach. And we know that this way will definitely yield the right result. In other cases, it's going to be more art than science. And it will be innovators that will come in and say, hang on, how about we go about it this way? Uh, and it was only then when we apply the data analysis to it, well, actually, this new way is is a much better way. So, you know, part of the things we're looking at in the governance and the assurance uh, sort of visions, you know, the, the, the idea of gate, gateways and gates in terms of uh, projects is really well understood. But if we've got that unblinking eye of, uh, you know, of assurance and we've got other aspects where we're doing more, more adaptive, we, we might one day ask the question, do we need gates? Now, that's heretic today to say we could run a project without <laughs> gates, but we might be there. I don't know whether that's an eventuality or not, but it will take someone that will say, hang on a minute, why don't we run some projects over in this portfolio without any gates for a year or two and see what happens? Uh, and then through the analysis, this experiment of project management, we come up and find actually it's a better way of doing it. It aligns better with our human behaviour to, to run projects without gates. I don't know. We might be completely, it'd be a car crash and we'll go back saying we need more gates. But we don't know today, do we? Because it's an experiment. So in terms of that, I, is this about Turkey's vote for Christmas? So if you're talking about the assurance community and they're all thinking, you know, Andy's going to put them all out of work now. You know, all these assurance people are not going to have a job. And then James is reinventing QS in, right? So there's a vision going to come out for, Q, for, for the QS. So what does that mean? And what does it mean at a human level, Donny? You know, so if we go to James first, talk about the QS vision and then over to Donny. What does it mean at a human level? where we engage people in this so they don't feel like they're going to do themselves out of a job. It's a better job. It's a more fulfilling job. So James first about, you know, are we just voting for uh, Turkey's vote for Christmas? And it's, it, you're right, this this goes to a very kind of human uh, emotion. And um, the, the answer is no, because, you know, the skills that say a QS has got is still valuable. Now, if I, I think back to the days when I was, you know, doing QSing, I'd spend 80% of my time doing really bog standard, boring work, like quantity takeoff and stuff. And then 20% of that time providing proper value to a client by giving him insights from that. Now, the way I see it is that we shift that the other way around. So we go to 20% of boring manual tasks because it's all been automated and we use these tools. And then 80% of our time giving clients proper insights and proper value. That's got to be better. So it's nothing to be afraid of, but there are, you know, we ca we can't hide away from the fact that there is always a bit of fear when things like this happen. It's happened. Um, the horse and cart move into to cars. There's every every point in history where there's change. There's people who resist change. That's just natural human behaviour. But as you say, Martin, it's about making them understand there's a better future. So it's not throwing um your skills out the window it's saying you can use your skills and you can now build on those skills to give yourself something much more exciting or you can say well i'm not going to change i'm not going to learn these tools and then you will be irrelevant you know so it's a choice that people can make and what i'm trying to say within my organization is giving people as many options as humanly possible to go on this journey and that may be a really simple hour conversation with myself and Martin over lunch, or it might be a degree course in data science, and we offer everything in between. And, and Mark, you know, we want to offer that to clients as well to to let them tread onto the treadmill at a point that they're happy with. It might be before the treadmill start walking, or it might be when the treadmill's already moving quite fast, and they someone feels confident to get on it already running. I think, and, and if we do that, then you've got much more chance of of bringing people along and again i don't think it's anything to be scared of like i've, I've used qsing but i'm sure andy and donnie can come up with examples from this their professions as well in terms of every profession if i go back to if i time travel back to 1885 when gleeds first started you know a qs would be totally different to what we're doing now so it's absolutely natural that the roles emerge and all we're doing is we're accelerating that but we're actually trying to take control of it so yeah, things will change, but I think, you know, we've got an opportunity to shape it for the better. 
And Donnie, in terms of the human sort of component, how do we get people to buy into these visions and to help us to shape it and help us deliver some of the components and they don't feel like they're going to do themselves out of a job? I'll link it back initially to the, I think at the moment we are now all catching up a pace in that you see this matrix-like view of everything that's coming in on a daily basis. So the professions are likely patching up and have you know I, I believe you know the APM's putting out something on data skills shortly I know Andy Martin were looking at doing another skills framework a, a, a slightly different version of that but the the professional bodies are going to need to oh my god we're going to need to jump ahead a few years change what we say the job description what we say a project manager at Quantity Surveyor is say at the highest level what the capabilities are so that the individual, back to your pure human, Martin, can go right. So this is the direction of travel. And people might might say, I want to be a market gardener or whatever. This is not for me. Never signed up to this. That's fine. So that takes a little bit of the fear out of it for, to, to do that. Then, of course, there's the development. I mean, there are very, very few things at the moment. There's the apprenticeships, Martin, which you know exceptionally well. And there are some other things. But, you know, is every course at the moment getting imbued with this? I don't know. I've got a, I'm doing my other MSc bit of tutoring in a few months' time. I've got a call with a lady I do it with. And one of the questions I've got for her, well, I'm not there to talk about data analytics on my arms, leadership, but is is that what's within the MSc now? You know, what, is this now, whatever it is in the built environment or projects world, is it getting sprinkled with this to go, don't be scared of this, this is what's um, going to come? I've got a broader people thing, as you know, Martin, so I'd love to add in it, but not, I don't think it's aligned to this conversation. And the people who do want to be adaptable and who want to build those capabilities and want to move in that direction, fine. But they can't, the other people, as James has said, you can't lose that expertise with somebody going, I'm not wanting to engage with this. You just need to find a way of tweaking what it is they do, because what's trapped up here, you sure as hell do not want to lose at least until Elon Musk gets a chip in the back of our necks and we can download them and then then they can get rid of them. Yeah, cool. So just before we go on to the questions, so Joe, are you still there? So would you like to throw some comments in, Joe, in terms of, of this conversation so far? Is there anything you want to add from government? Joe may not be there. She may be on a call. Right, let's go over to the... Oh. Oh, there she is. I am, I am. You need to give me some warning. No, no, I've been listening intently. Um, yeah, and you, you won't be... Sorry, Martin, go on, go on. What was the question before I launch in? So it's for everybody's benefit. Jo is part of the task force. She's been a pathfinder on this. She works in the Infrastructure Projects Authority, and she's responsible for transforming project delivery across all of government. You know, what a cool job. So, mm -hmm. Jo, what's government's take on these visions, everything we've been talking about, the need to disrupt, the need to think differently, why 2025, et cetera. So what's your take on it? Well, those who know me will know why I'm pushing for 2025, because uh, the planet's on fire. Um, uh, you know, they're already projecting to exceed one and a half degrees, global temperature rise by 2027. You know, this isn't, these are just timescales and a reality that uh, I find really hard to deal with, actually. Even I've been questioning my chutzpah and, and my oomph and my unrelated, unrelenting uh, purpose and drive to make a difference in the shortest time I can through the work I do for the planet and project delivery, through every single choice we make every single day, regardless of the project we're delivering, has a vast, vast potential to deliver positive benefits against the UN SDGs and minimise harm against it. And it is all underpinned that the potential to release that power is all underpinned by data and data analytics. And our courage to make a difference and our willingness to sit with discomfort and our preparedness to change and only every individual can decide what they 
will look back on as a life well lived at the end of their lives because that's what it is um and i can't make it sound any prettier than that because it's not it's really bloody grim so um that's why i applied for this job um because i wanted to find the role where i could make the biggest difference have the greatest influence i'm extraordinarily privileged to have it i feel that privilege and gratitude every single day um but i'm, I'm actually going through a bit of a ah but what you know what a, how, how am i doing you know how am i doing how am i measuring up to that and i don't think i'm doing anywhere near enough yet um so we need to step up i completely agree about the power of the community you know so we've got mpa here we know adam bodison at the apm you know with a beautiful strap line that, that he initiated um because when projects succeed society benefits it's beautiful we've got emma howard boyd as well at the mpa former chair of the environment agency we've got anusha shah coming in as president of the ice in november and her huge passion for caring for nature you know things we just don't even hear about um so if, uh, and ricks you know thankfully james has as you know invited me and martin to join him at the ricks global conference tomorrow where we'll be talking about exactly this so never has the need been greater to change in the shortest time never has the leadership alignment been stronger and so it is simply it will be simply down to us whether we achieve this or not and if we don't we've no one else to blame because it's all there the need is there and the ability is there um i'm not but i'm not saying it's easy it's bloody hard and that's why you know our, our resilience our tenacity our collaboration and i and i use that you know it's an overused word isn't it but genuinely our, our willingness to take care of each other and support each other and and have each other's backs and champion each other and this is why this is why we're working with donny and kelvin mcgrath at the ipa where we are piloting the use of the meeting quality tool so we are using this tool to understand the emotions of our team how do you feel about delivering tip transforming infrastructure performance to be business as usual by 2025 how do you feel about that is it a compelling vision how invested in it are you how how, how are you feeling right now how sustainable is your working practice and we're doing this survey every week and then so this is this is data and analytics it's giving us insights on the team morale on the team emotions and every week we do a short 45 second survey we get the results within 24 hours and donny then leads the team through it about what we what insights we're getting and i can see that not all the team was behind it not all the team get it how how valuable is it that i know that now within three weeks of using this tool not two years down the line when we haven't achieved it three weeks i can see that not all of my team are saying no I, I don't get it it's not clear i don't think we're going to achieve it great now i understand that now i know it it's not invisible to me this has helped expose it now i can do something really valuable around that and help the team and thank you to Donny and thank you to Kelvin because it's absolutely vital. And, and you know, what does every brilliant team that achieves do? It, they trust each other, they've got each other's back and they care. And this tool is helping us understand that. So thank you, Donny, and thank you to oh, Kelvin. Martin, do you mind if I just chip in and I'll, I'll take it to yeah. a more technical level, which is thank you for saying all that, Joe, is the interesting bit. And I know I've shared this with Andy and and, and Martin that they but once you have that insight, you, that human, you then can actually map it right through to the final decisions about the things that stakeholders and clients are interested in, cost, schedule and so on. So just imagine you had a, you understood the bias of key, key decision makers within a project, the level of psychological safety they felt, the quality, the dynamics within the team, et cetera, et cetera. All of that. So it's not 
people, then you map it to the process and then you map it to the actual decisions and say, crikey, that is overly optimistic or that is decisions made. And that's a link, Martin, also back to the assurance. I mean, assurance professionals can do something very different if they actually knew underneath the surface what was going on with the data that they typically look at. Anyway, I'll shut up at that. I get very passionate about it all. <laughs> Hi, cool. So, Jake, in the last five minutes, could you just post a few links in chat? So to contact you if they want to know more about the visions or want to get involved in the visions. Uh, a link to the hack as well. So let's tell them about the hacks. So if they want to come on and start to deliver some of these visions and shape some of the challenges, then great. If they want to go on to the apprenticeship as well, the academy, um, and start to learn about this stuff. So, Joe, if you could mention that as well, about what you're doing about the academy as well, and trying well, to sort of uh, breed this intelligent customer type sort of role as well. And then lastly, um, the link to where the visions are going to be posted as well, Jake, because we need to get them live, yeah? Cool. Yes. So, um, if I just pick these questions up, so given the nature of projects, the variable entity that is project team and disparate approaches to planning, um, who can determine which data generated is of quality, valuable and relevant? All right. So that's a great question. And I think we're trying to grapple with that through the concept of something called a project brain. So I think that's something for another day. But basically, it takes all the questions you're trying to answer as project professionals. So why are you here? You know, why do you do project delivery? So what's the problem you're trying to answer? And then we can see if the data is going to feed in to answer those questions. If it isn't, it's misaligned with the problem statement. And if it's misaligned with the problem statement, then you can't answer that question. So in due course, government is going to be saying whose data is most aligned to the problem statement who's most in control of their data, so they're flying their plane with a fully instrumented cockpit that is appropriate to their stage of flight, all right? That's where we're going to finish up with. Now, in the interim, we've got to start to understand what is the quality of the data. And a lot of organisations don't even understand it. So I speak to National Highways and they're starting to get all over this, and some other organisations, they haven't got a clue what the quality of the data is. I haven't got a clue because it's all in spreadsheets, it's, it, it's federated, it's on people's drives, it's stuck in bits of SharePoint, etc. So has anybody got anything else to add on that? Yeah, Martin, so I think this is the part of the reimagining, isn't it? That we think about data, we think about, uh, if you like, almost a manual task of going to get data <clears throat> in order to then uh, clean it and prepare it and then use it for our analytics. And if I give you you know, an example of, you know, um, where we've moved away from that and we're just using effectively auto-generated data is to take the London Transport Network. Um, you know, we used to pay people to travel around that network and record how long it took them so that they could report back journey times. And then if you're involved in any projects at Transport for London, you would then have to model the improvement on uh, on journey times and you would you know, then be able to track before and after as to whether journey times on those particular routes had improved or, or not. Then Oyster Card came along and actually that data is just generally available. It's real-time data is collected and it's saved. And we don't have to worry about sending people around the network to do these journey times so we can actually find people that have traveled from this point to that point and has it improved or not. So that's just one example of where you know the the data, a lot of the data we're talking about, we'll we'll stop thinking about how do we get it, and it'll just be automatically provided. It's just it's already there, and we just need to you know get the the feeds from it, you know, and then use it as we need it, rather than you know spend huge amounts of money to go and get it. So our thinking about data will just change. Yeah, I think absolutely spot on. And at the moment, there's people who's fat fingering it into a keyboard. We should be ripping <laughs> exactly. it out of corporate systems. Yeah. You know, we should be ripping it out and then. Yeah. And we're checking it on the way in. So we, yeah. so Alan Perkins from National Highway said to me, he stopped arguing about the data. So people yeah. go through this process, they look at the dashboards and say, well, I don't believe that because I don't trust the data. So we went back and said, well, it's your data. Why don't you trust it? You're accountable for your data. That's lifted up the quality of the data. And now there's no more debates about the data. Yeah. And I th it's quite advanced. I don't think there's many organisations like that, but that's exactly where we should be. 
so folks we've run out of time i'm afraid so we've got one minute left so just to try and summarize we're going to be rolling these visions out we are going to be delivering them together we're going to use the power of the crowd to make these happen um we are making them happen these modules if you want to get involved in shaping them if you want to bring data if you want to bring a challenge to a hackathon and work with joe and andy and the apm to have a thousand person hack in october just imagine what we can do with these visions if that happens right we can do this stuff so we will change the profession through these visions that is for certain right so please get involved this is your opportunity you know you can either get involved and shape it you can stand in the shadows and watch it or you can go and sit somewhere else and just ignore it because it's not going to impact you i think you've got three choices and i know which one i'm in all right so thank you so much for your time if you can dial back in we are going to alternate these between lunch times and evenings because people can make different ones so we'll see you at the evening event uh, 6th of june where we'll be talking about assurance and what this means and then we'll start to drill into each of these about every two weeks or so i'm going to try and put on some physical events as well where we can all get together and chew this over with some round table events and a few beers or soft drinks um so thank you so much everybody and a big thanks to the panel i do appreciate it thank yeah you. very kind of you thank um you, stay safe all and i'll see you on the 6th of june hopefully